and they are, the results are inferred in a sense. PCR is separate from that. It's just a process that's used to make a whole lot of something out of something. That's what also, it is. Um, but it's, but it's not, it doesn't tell you that you're sick, and it doesn't tell you that the thing you ended up with really was going to hurt you or anything like that. That's why it's not. So even if you believe in HIV, it can't tell the difference between virus particles or active live virus. I mean, there's a lot of questions. The test that we have for the virus does not tell us whether we have an active virus in a person. It's been called uh, by the media a case. And the UK has recorded almost 3,000 new cases of coronavirus. The rise in the number of cases that we've seen today is concerning. A case is when someone gets sick from a disease. That's completely different from a positive test. It's not a case at all. It's just that we can detect that at some time in the past, perhaps, there has been viral infection, but it's probably been removed now. The test is called a RT-PCR test. It's otherwise known as a viral load test. And the test is a surrogate test. It was, it was developed and by a guy named Kerry Mullis, who was given the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for essentially inventing the technique of this test. And he said very specifically, you cannot use this test to either prove infectious etiology or to diagnose an infectious disease, which of course is interesting because if you can't use it to diagnose an infectious disease, that, of course, begs the question of what can you use it for? But let me back up here and describe what a surrogate test means, because this is very important to understanding the situation we're currently in. Uh, a surrogate test means that in a situation where you're trying to prove causation, you have to have a gold standard test. And those postulates, like with meningococcus, that is a gold standard test it's reliable 100% of the time. You cannot use a surrogate test to prove anything. And that is what is happening with these tests. So what is the surrogate test? So remember that we don't have a gold standard. We don't have isolation, purification, reinfection. We don't have viremia. We don't have millions of copies demonstrated on an electron microscope. We essentially have no idea who has this coronavirus disease. So then they take a piece of one of the coronaviruses, the new one that they found. It has a new RNA sequence that hasn't been found before. They take one of the sequences, which they say is unique to that particular virus, and they do something called amplify it. And what that means is you take it in, in your blood, you'll have one copy of this sequence, and it's too small, you can't find it. So you stimulate it, and this is what Kerry Mullis came up with. You stimulate it, it makes two copies, that's one cycle. You make four copies, that's two. You make uh, two to the 20th copies, whatever number that is, that's 20 cycles. And what you find with this test is that once you put it through approximately 36 cycles, then you start to see the color change that tells you it's positive. So if you do 35 cycles, it's still too small to see. If you do 36, you start to see it, but you get false negatives, even though you don't really know which is a false negative because you don't have anything to compare it with. So then you do 37 and you see it, you know, 5% of the time of people with these symptoms, and you say, that's the number. But here's where it gets interesting. If you do it 40 times, you start seeing a lot more positives. And then here's something else to know. If you do it 60 times, so if you amplify it over and over and over again, it becomes positive with 100% of the people. Let me say that again. If you amplify it 60 times, it will be positive with everybody. That means that everybody has a piece of this RNA somewhere in their cells or in their genome or somewhere in their secretions. If you, all you have to do is amplify it enough. And the problem is we don't know how many false positives or false, false negatives there are because we have nothing to compare it to. And if the, you know, all biological tests have false positives, so if you test 30 million people, 
and you have a 1% false positive rate, then 300,000 people by definition will test positive and then you have an epidemic. And then if you want to demonstrate that the epidemic got better, all you have to do is lower the amplification cycles to 35 and then suddenly your you know, vitamin C or your vaccine or your chloroquine or whatever you did worked and now there's no more people testing positive. That is fraught with problems and that is the problem. And unfortunately, with every country has their own standard of what kind of cycles they put it through the number. So you see very different numbers coming out of very different places, depending on, on the number of amplification cycles that they're standardizing their test to. And I hope everybody is getting the point that this is a crazy situation. Not just general testing and, and PCR testing, whether you should test asymptomatic people, just symptomatic, how many contacts. Um, Dr. Bhattacharya, what, what is the, uh, this asymptomatic testing with PCR? But particularly, I think one of the things that's been put out, the New York Times had an article about a month ago uh, looking at some of the test results in New York and in, uh, I believe, Nevada and Massachusetts. And they found that uh, because the PCR tests are so sensitive, that up to 90% of the positives were not identifying live infectious virus. And, um, and then I think there's other, other studies that have come out. I know Oxford's Center for Evidence-Based Medicine says that the, if you have uh, such high sensitivity, you cannot be any, there's no guarantee you're even identifying live virus. Uh, and I think that, I guess, one, just what does that mean for some of the testing and the case numbers that we see? But then two, it seems to me that if you're uh, test positive with no symptoms with a very sensitive PCR test, and they can't even tell you if you're infectious, we're, we're quarantining across the country probably hundreds of thousands or millions of people who aren't even contagious. And I think that obviously has a huge cost to society. Doesn't seem to be getting a lot of discussion though. The, the key thing about the PCR technology that I, I think is important for this discussion is that the, uh, the, 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 essentially you were doubling the genetic material if it's present of the virus if it's present, right? Uh, if you have a very tiny amount of the virus, or if it's a viral fragment that's not actually it, it, that, you, that your body has, has a, a successfully attacked, um, uh, your missus is successfully attacked, then what you're what you're uh, what you're amplifying is something that's not going to, to pose any risk either to you or to others. So you're asymptomatic. The PCR is you're 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 you're, you're positive with the PCR. Uh, it's not a false positive in a technical sense, but in a functional sense, it's a false positive. Uh, epidemiologically, it's a false positive, right? I'm not going to infect you, even though I have this vial, uh, uh, the, the, even though I'm PCR positive, because it took so many doublings to reach the point that we can infer that we, there really wasn't very much gene a genetic material for the virus present to begin with. Um, I, I think that uh, you're, you're, you're absolutely right to point out the cost of that when you attach it to a policy of contact tracing and isolation and quarantine. Uh, we effectively are quarantining people on the basis of PCR tests, uh, a functional false positive PCR tests, uh, where it will have no effect on disease spread because they're not, inf they're not infectious. Um, and uh, at the same time, we'll impose enormous costs on them. Actually, the other, there's another follow-on cost to that is that it, it makes people less willing to, to cooperate with contact tracers because they know the costs um, if I t if I am contact traced and I'm asked to say who I've interacted with, I, I know if I tell people tell say I interact with you know with with, with my friends, they're they're going to be facing the same thing. They might get quarantined, and if, and if the if it's if it's likely it's as possible as a false positive, a functional false positive, then uh, I'm imposing cost on them for nothing. I think in LA County, I saw a, a, a LA Times story that 60 percent of of people who are contacted, who, 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 who were put in touch with contact tracers, they won't cooperate with them. And you can see why. Uh, the cost of essentially ratting your friends out is, is enormous.